My name is Dr. Avi Herskowitz and I'm uh, trained as, uh, in, as an internal medicine doctor, uh, as a cardiologist, and as an immunologist. Uh, my most recent academic appointment has been as clinical professor at UC San Francisco, but before then, uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins Hospital for about 12 years, uh, I did have an immune um, an Im immunology laboratory which focused on virology. So I feel that um, I wanted to go past the posts that we've been posting for the last 10 or 11 days straight and talk to you directly. This is really for my own patients and my colleagues and also as president of American College of Advancement of Medicine or ACAM, I feel that uh, I would like to be a voice of reason and a voice of compassion in this difficult time for us all and also provide you today with what I think is the big picture as we stand on Tuesday afternoon. You know, I'm based in San Francisco and it's around 2 o'clock now in the afternoon or 5 o'clock East Coast time. I will uh, use some props uh, so um, and uh, I'll be occasionally looking off camera to focus on that because I wanted to get this message out as soon as possible. So f we're going to focus today on the big picture, where we really are relative to all the data from around the world. I also want to focus on who's really at risk, who has been um, suffering the most from this epidemic, uh, who, who is dying, what is, wh what is the worst case scenario in my opinion for the United States because there are extraordinary ranges of risk. I just wanted to provide a rational a rationale based on what I know from the data. Uh, I won't be talking much about uh, treatment. Um, I will talk about uh, that at a different time. So let's start with the big picture. Um, the big picture is the following. We know that the global epidemic has a mortality rate of 4.5%. The range is somewhere in the low 1 percentile, which we've used Korea as the example, and then the high, high, high risk is in Italy, which is at now 9.5%. Spain is immediately behind with around 7%. But for us in the United States, I want to emphasize that currently, as of today, our mortality rate is at 1.3% which is roughly the same as the Korean model. They're about a month ahead of us and have now largely returned life back to normal in the big cities. So the range is great. Uh, the mid range is around four and a half percent and the up range, uh, I will explain why, why this is not likely to be the case in the United States in a few minutes. In our ground zero for the US, we have New York State and right now, and, and New York City of course, right now the mortality rate in New York State is also less than 1%. There are 90 new deaths in New York State in the last two days and when you normalize it for the population it's roughly one-third to one-half of the rate that's currently seen in Italy and Spain. So there is encouraging data coming from New York even today that would suggest that it may not be as bad as it is in Italy and Spain. And we'll talk about why that may be the case in a few minutes as well. So our range right now is low and nationally. It's also low in, in other regions other than New York, for example, California. Uh, is at also as is at less than is at 1.2 some odd percent. Now, who is at risk? So, based on the data from Italy, half the deaths occur in patients that have more than three comorbid conditions. What that means is they have more than three of the conditions that, for example, are hypertension, diabetes heart disease, chronic lung disease, or cancer. So roughly half the deaths are occurring in patients with other serious conditions. 
And then the, the most impressive information out there is that the younger population below the age of 60 is at very low risk for mortality. And again, of, of those that are uh, dying, that have died uh, from this terrible uh, virus, they have had comorbid conditions. The rare case of a healthy person in their 30s and 40s uh, are not predictable and occur probably through genetic predispositions to this given particular virus, but again, it's exceptionally low risk. So I, I would not, as an average person, worry about that. I would be concerned above the age of 70 as a general rule, which is, I think, right now coming at 8% mortality rates and above 80 is anywhere from 11 to 25%, depending on who you, now which studies you look at. So obviously the elderly population as a whole, particularly those with comorbid conditions, are at risk. Um, how long will this epidemic last in the United States? This is probably the most prevalent question right now. And I, and I agree with the President's uh, comment today that says that regionally we will have differences. Uh, for example, in California, where we're flat, uh, we may be able to get back to some semblance of normality in a three-week period of time. Other sections of the country may take up to two months to get back to a normalcy. I use the example of Seoul, Korea, where it's around 200 miles from their version of Ground Zero in the southern part, and now, a month after the lockdown in Seoul, which is a city of 20 some odd million people, they're back to essentially a normal approach to life, although it's not completely, the economics are not completely normal, but they're back to shopping and back to going outside, which is what we all wish for all of us in the country. There are only 40 new cases in the last week in Korea. 46 new cases in China and 14 new cases in Japan, all indicating that there is no signal yet for a second wave. Um, schools are still out in each of these three countries and we'll have to watch carefully if that happens, if the second wave is, is apparent, but um, right now there's no signal for that, so that's also room for hope. One question that I get asked is, what is, the, what is your version of the worst case scenario? And, and I think that just saying that, like the governor said in California, that 56% of the Californians will ultimately get the virus is a um, fairly superficial way to looking at things, although I understand the rationale for, for, for Governor Newsom for saying that. And I also understand the rationale for Governor Cuomo for raising the flags in New York where the information is a lot more um, unclear. So I think that if we follow what happened to the Italians over the last two weeks, uh, we can map out, I think, a logical worst case scenario because while we have our ground zero in New York City, which is a larger metropolis than northern Italy, we have a lot more resources to apply to them. And we also have the data of new treatments that are now going to be widely pushed into the New York sector so that we could um, reasonably believe that we can treat some of the critically ill patients there better than they can uh, in, the, in the overwhelmed uh, medical system in northern Italy. So let's just say that the first two weeks ago, Italy ro raised its cases by a fivefold, and then the last week they raised it for another two and a half fold, so roughly 12 and a half times larger the number of deaths that they had two weeks ago. So that would indicate, if we currently used the 593 deaths in the United States, that we would have roughly 12,500 deaths in the United States two weeks from now assuming that we could get all the resources possible into the New York area. Now, let's just say that that estimate is 
off by a factor of 10. That is certainly possible, particularly if New York takes off in a, in a, in a roller coaster fashion. So that would be 125,000 deaths in the United States as a definitively, um, in my opinion, is a, a, in a definitive um, worst case scenario. And even then, it's a fraction of 1%. Now, if New York City roughly is 60% of all that, as it is today, 60% of all deaths in the US are in New York, then that is a damning number. And we will do everything in our power as a government and as a society to limit that. And there are many reasons to believe that that won't happen. When you look at the trends over the last two days in New York, the trends do not indicate um, that worst case scenario is about to happen, although again, we'll know a lot more over the next three, four days. So what about um, symptoms? I've had a number of patients contact me with runny noses and with productive coughs, and some of them with diarrheal illnesses, and I tell them that this is very unlikely to be related to the COVID-19 virus which it does not typically have those symptoms, but rather has the, um, the dry cough with uh, the sore throat, leading ultimately with fever, of course, uh, and then leading to uh, a, a pneumonia-like picture with a dry cough and shortness of breath. But the, co the classic cold with a runny nose and, um, and congestion, and nasal congestion, and with a productive cough, which is, produces sputum, is not the typical pattern of this. Um, we have um, a lot of new treatments that will become online, which I'll go into in, in the next um, video that I'll probably make tomorrow. But overall, the message is clear that right now, regionally, we have to focus on New York City. We do not have signals across the country yet for other major metropolitan areas being um, affected in an accelerated way, but I'll keep on watching and we all should watch in Miami and Chicago and Los Angeles and so on. In my city in San Francisco, our case numbers are rising because we're testing now uh, with drive-by testing and so on, but, but we have yet to to, um, to notify uh, a single death yet. So in the state of California as a whole, including LA, we're at a very low mortality rate, like in Washington, despite the fact that Washington had the, the nidus of illness in their nursing home. So I wanna thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to um, having you guys join us on, on social media, which will be streaming uh, on your screen in just a minute. And um, my heart goes to all of the folks that are affected, and um, we hope to, to be a, a, a source of reason and hope and compassion for the, for the foreseeable future. Take care, bye-bye.